英語聞き流し10分間名作リスニング英語テキストと MP3 ダウンロードその他の物語はホームページよりご利用いただけます 88thpp.com 88thpp.com Fortunately for his peace, his former owner was killed in a drunken brawl at the Kermessa of Mechlin, and so sought not after him nor disturbed him in his new and well loved home. A few years later, old Jihan Das, who had always been a cripple, became so paralyzed with rheumatism that it was impossible for him to go out with the cart anymore. Then little Nello, being now grown to his sixth year of age, and knowing the town well from having accompanied his grandfather so many times, took his place beside the cart, and sold the milk and received the coins in exchange. And brought them back to their respective owners with a pretty grace and seriousness which charmed all who beheld him. The little Ardennes was a beautiful child, with dark, grave, tender eyes, and a lovely bloom upon his face, and fair locks that clustered to his throat, and many an artist sketched the group as it went by him the green cart with the brass flagons of Tenier and Miris and Van Tal, and the great tawny coloured, massive dog, with his belt harness that chimed cheerily as he went. And the small figure that ran beside him, which had little white feet and great wooden shoes, and a soft, grave, innocent, happy face like the little fair children of Rubens. Nello and Patrisky did the work so well and so joyfully together that Jehan Doss himself, when the summer came and he was better again, had no need to stir out, but could sit in the doorway in the sun and see them go forth through the garden wicket, and then doze and dream and pray a little, and then awake again as the clock told three and watch for their return. And on their return, Patrisky would shake himself free of his harness with a bay of glee, and Nello would recount with pride the doings of the day, and they would all go in together to their meal of rye bread and milk or soup, and would see the shadows lengthen over the great plain, and see the twilight veil the fair cathedral spire, and then lie down together to sleep peacefully while the old man said a prayer. So the days and the years went on, and the lives of Nello and Patrisky were happy, innocent, and healthful. In the spring and summer, especially, were they glad. Flanders is not a lovely land. And around the burg of Rubens, it is perhaps least lovely of all. Corn and calza, pasture and plough, succeed each other on the characterless plain in wearying repetition, and save by some gaunt grey tower, with its peal of pathetic bells, or some figure coming athwart the fields, made picturesque by a gleaner's bundle or a woodman's faggot, there is no change, no variety, no beauty anywhere, and he who has dwelt upon the mountains or amidst the forests feels oppressed as by imprisonment with the tedium and the endlessness of that vast and dreary level. But it is green and very fertile, and it has wide horizons that have a certain charm of their own even in their dullness and monotony, and among the rushes by the waterside the flowers grow, and the trees rise tall and fresh where the barges glide with their great hulks black against the sun, and their little green barrels and vari coloured flags gay against the leaves. Anyway, there is greenery and breadth of space enough to be as good as beauty to a child and a dog, and these two asked no better, when their work was done, than to lie buried in the lush grasses on the side of the canal. And watch the cumbrous vessels drifting by and bring the crisp salt smell of the sea among the blossoming scents of the country summer. True, in the winter it was harder, and they had to rise in the darkness and the bitter cold, and they had seldom as much as they could have eaten any day, and the hut was scarce better than a shed when the nights were cold, although it looked so pretty in warm weather, buried in a great kindly clambering vine, that never bore fruit, indeed, but which covered it with luxuriant green tracery all through the months of blossom and harvest. In winter, the winds found many holes in the walls of the poor little hut, and the vine was black and leafless, and the bare lands looked very bleak and drear without, and sometimes within the floor was flooded and then frozen. In winter, it was hard, and the snow numbed the little white limbs of Nello, and the icicles cut the brave, untiring feet of Patrisky. But even then, they were never heard to lament, either of them. The child's wooden shoes and the dog's four legs would trot manfully together over the frozen fields to the chime of the bells on the harness. And then sometimes, in the streets of Antwerp, some housewife would bring them a bowl of soup and a handful of bread, or some kindly trader would throw some billets of fuel into the little cart as it went homeward, or some woman in their own village would bid them keep a share of the milk they carried for their own food, and they would run over the white lands, through the early darkness, bright and happy, and burst with a shout of joy into their home. So, on the whole, it was well with them, very well, and Patrisky. Meeting on the highway or in the public streets, the many dogs who toiled from daybreak into nightfall, paid only with blows and curses, and loosened from the shafts with a kick to starve and freeze as best they might. Patrisky, in his heart, was very grateful to his fate, and thought it the fairest and the kindliest the world could hold. Though he was often very hungry indeed when he lay down at night, 
though he had to work in the heats of summer noons and the rasping chills of winter dawns, though his feet were often tender with wounds from the sharp edges of the jagged pavement, though he had to perform tasks beyond his strength and against his nature, yet he was grateful and content, he did his duty with each day, and the eyes that he loved smiled down on him. It was sufficient for Patrisky. There was only one thing which caused Patrisky any uneasiness in his life, and it was this. Antwerp, as all the world knows, is full at every turn of old piles of stones, dark and ancient and majestic, standing in crooked courts, jammed against gateways and taverns, rising by the water's edge, with bells ringing above them in the air, and ever and again out of their arched doors a swell of music pealing. There they remain, the grand old sanctuaries of the past, shut in amidst the squalor, the hurry, the crowds, the unloveliness and the commerce of the modern world, and all day long the clouds drift and the birds circle and the winds sigh around them, and beneath the earth at their feet there sleeps, Rubens. And the greatness of the mighty master still rests upon Antwerp, and wherever we turn in its narrow streets his glory lies therein, so that all mean things are thereby transfigured, and as we pace slowly through the winding ways, and by the edge of the stagnant water, and through the noisome courts, his spirit abides with us, and the heroic beauty of his visions is about us, and the stones that once felt his footsteps and bore his shadow seem to arise and speak of him with living voices. For the city which is the tomb of Reuben still lives to us through him, and him alone. It is so quiet there by that great white sepulchre, so quiet, save only when the organ peals and the choir cries aloud the Sav Regina or the Kyrie Eleeson. Sure no artist ever had a greater gravestone than that pure marble sanctuary gives to him in the heart of his birthplace in the chancel of St. Jacques. Without Rubens, what were Antwerp? A dirty, dusky, bustling mart, which no man would ever care to look upon save the traders who do business on its wharves. With Rubens, to the whole world of men it is a sacred name, a sacred soil, a Bethlehem where a god of art saw light, a Golgotha where a god of art lies dead. O nations! Closely should you treasure your great men, for by them alone will the future know of you. Flanders in her generations has been wise. In his life she glorified this greatest of her sons, and in his death she magnifies his name. But her wisdom is very rare. Now, the trouble of Patrisky was this. Into these great, sad piles of stones, that reared their melancholy majesty above the crowded roofs, the child Nella would many and many a time enter, and disappear through their dark arched portals, whilst Patrisky, left without upon the pavement, would wearily and vainly ponder on what could be the charm which thus allured from him his inseparable and beloved companion. Once or twice he did essay to see for himself, clattering up the steps with his milk cart behind him, but thereon he had been always sent back again summarily by a tall custodian in black clothes and silver chains of office, and fearful of bringing his little master into trouble, he desisted, and remained couched patiently before the churches until such time as the boy reappeared. It was not the fact of his going into them which disturbed Patrisky, he knew that people went to church, all the village went to the small, tumble-down, grey pile opposite the red windmill. What troubled him was that little Nello always looked strangely when he came out, always very flushed or very pale and whenever he returned home after such visitations would sit silent and dreaming, not caring to play, but gazing out at the evening skies beyond the line of the canal, very subdued and almost sad. What was it? wondered Patrisky. He thought it could not be good or natural for the little lad to be so grave, and in his dumb fashion he tried all he could to keep Nello by him in the sunny fields or in the busy marketplace. But to the churches Nello would go, most often of all would he go to the great cathedral, and Patrisky, left without on the stones by the iron fragments of Quentin Matsus's gate, would stretch himself and yawn and sigh, and even howl now and then, all in vain, until the doors closed and the child perforce came forth again, and winding his arms about the dog's neck would kiss him on his broad, tawny-coloured forehead, and murmur always the same words, if I could only see them, Patrisky. If I could only see them. What were they? pondered Patrisky, looking up with large, wistful, sympathetic eyes. One day, when the custodian was out of the way and the doors left ajar, he got in for a moment after his little friend and saw. They were two great covered pictures on either side of the choir. Nello was kneeling, wrapped as in an ecstasy, before the altar picture of the Assumption, and when he noticed Patrisky, and rose and drew the dog gently out into the air, his face was wet with tears, and he looked up at the veiled places as he passed them, and murmured to his companion, It is so terrible not to see them, Patrisky, just because one is poor and cannot pay. He never meant that the poor should not see them when he painted them, I am sure. He would have had us see them any day, every day, that I am sure. And they keep them shrouded there, shrouded in the dark, the beautiful things, and they never feel the light and no eyes look on them, unless rich people come and pay. If I could only see them, I would be content to die. 
but he could not see them, and Patrisky could not help him, for to gain the silver piece that the church exacts as the price for looking on the glories of the elevation of the cross and the descent of the cross was a thing as utterly beyond the powers of either of them as it would have been to scale the heights of the cathedral spire. They had never so much as a suit to spare, if they cleared enough to get a little wood for the stove, a little broth for the pot, it was the utmost they could do. And yet the heart of the child was set in sore and endless longing upon beholding the greatness of the two veiled Rubens. The whole soul of the little Ardennes thrilled and stirred with an absorbing passion for art. Going on his ways through the old city in the early days before the sun or the people had risen, Nello, who looked only a little peasant boy, with a great dog drawing milk to sell from door to door, was in a heaven of dreams whereof Rubens was the god. Nello, cold and hungry, with stockingless feet in wooden shoes, and the winter winds blowing among his curls and lifting his poor thin garments, was in a rapture of meditation, wherein all that he saw was the beautiful fair face of the Mary of the Assumption, with the waves of her golden hair lying upon her shoulders, and the light of an eternal sun shining down upon her brow. Nello, reared in poverty, and buffeted by fortune, and untaught in letters, and unheeded by men, had the compensation or the curse which is called genius. <laughs> 英語聞き流し10分間名作リスニング英語テキストと MP3 ダウンロードその他の物語はホームページよりご利用いただけます 88thpp.com 88thpp.com